My guest today on the uh, Dan Speaks podcast is Erica Abiel, a well-known uh, novelist who's written five or six books, almost all of which are uh, about the early days of the women's movement, actually the precursor to the early days. She'll tell us all about that. And uh, our new book, which is just being released, is called Tommy. And my first question about that is, um, <clears throat> the, 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 where was the commune in reality? I know you've heard, you've heard this is a book of fiction. Yes. But, uh, but there was such a commune out here with, I think, Betty Ab and others. And tell, tell us about, you what you know about that. Absolutely. It's called, the book is called The Commune, and it visits a group of feminist writers and intellectual hangers-on um, who lived in Betty Friedan's Hampton's house, which she called, it was actually a group house, which she gave the elevated name, The Commune. And this, they lived there together while uh, uh, they were planning the great historic strike for women's equality on August 26, 1970. It was a huge march down Fifth Avenue against the um, uh, uh, orders of the mayor who would not give them uh, the entire avenue. They, uh, Lindsay, I believe it was, said, keep on the sidewalk, ladies. But the whole thing flowed down Fifth Avenue, enormous, and basically put second wave feminism on the map. As for where the commune was, Dan, it had several iterations. It was basically a series of different houses. And I set my book in a composite commune, uh, part Drew Lane, part Job's Lane in Bridgehampton, part Sh a place called Sheldray Cove in Wainscott. I combined them all for the purposes of my book. I wanted something slightly spooky because these houses were basically white elephants that nobody else wanted to rent because they were impossible to heat. So how how does the uh, how did you structure the book and what was the uh, the theme and the I guess you would say the raison d'être of, of its existence? Why is it entertaining today? Uh, well, I uh, first of all I framed it with the the beginning of the march, which threatens to uh, dissolve into total mayhem because uh, it really wasn't planned and wasn't permitted, and then it ends with the march triumphant. And uh, why did I write it? Well, because basically it's extremely uh, fascinating to me that these people essentially created a social revolution that completely transformed the lives of women. And yet they themselves were kind of transitional figures. They weren't really ready to embrace the ideals of the revolution in their own lives. And so there was a lot of conflict there that I found very amusing to write about. Can they could talk the talk, but they couldn't walk the walk, as they say. Can you give an example of any of that? Oh, sure. I mean, basically, these women came out of an earlier period which valued marriage, uh, family, and relationship with men. And basically what, what the, new, the women's movement was saying in 1970 was, Autonomy, that was the big buzzword. Leave that boring husband and go out and fulfill your potential. You don't need a man. Uh, Gloria Steinem was quoted as saying, a, a woman needs a man like a fish needs a bicycle, that kind of thing. And so they were trying to live by that ideal of autonomy and not be dependent on men. But the old conditioning kind of whipsawed them back and forth so that, that there was con a constant conflict over that issue. I, I once uh, had lunch with Elaine Benson and Betty Friedan at the American Hotel in that era when the conversation was about how was she dressed properly for a date. Betty Friedan, <laughs> you know, how she looked and she was going out, she had been divorced and she was very much wanting to know uh, how she should handle it. Yes, well, uh... That is one of the ironies and, and, and through jokes of the book is that Betty Friedan, who was the intellectual founder of the women's movement, was basically man hungry. And she had a very difficult time with men. Um, partly her fame could get in the way and she was not considered beautiful. I, I don't need to tell you. 
although my uh, heroine in the book, Leora, thinks it finds her very compelling looking. And uh, yes, that's one of the, the running jokes in the book is that she liked women capital A, a capital W, excuse me, but she liked less individual women. She much preferred to have attractive men around and they are there in abundance in my novel. And that uh, all takes place uh, in the Hamptons. Yes, it's all set in the Hamptons. Well, which it was going on at that time. It was, and they were quite a presence because uh, as uh, the, the Betty character, I call her Gilda, as she says, we're the most interesting people around here. And they were very sought after, in fact, and they would throw, you know, these fundraisers for the march and everyone wanted to appear there, even though the women's husband said, you know, uh, you can't show up at that uh, bra burners event. So, but basically it was, it was the, uh, the heart party of the season. And the other very uh, um, popular event that they did was they played charades. And the charade games were attended by everyone who could, who could crash them. And they were very amusing because the uh, the communards were very intellectual and very well read, and they would pick these obscure things to act out. And then these um, you know real estate developers were thrown a charade to act out, you know something by Ludwig Wittgenstein, and of course they couldn't handle it at all, and would uh, would leave in a huff. So that, you know the book, I I tried to make it funny, and I do think it's funny in a rancid sort of way, because feminism is so often associated with preachiness, you know, and dreariness and stridency and uh, piousness, piety. And I wanted to make this funny. And in fact, one of the reviewers called it a joyous literary rump. And um, you're going to be having a, uh, a couple of readings that are coming up here in the East End. Uh, Tell us about them and when they are and where they are and how they're being done. Oh, well, July 16th, uh, both East Hampton and West Hampton Library are doing a joint Zoom. And then on August 25th, uh, Rogers Memorial Library in Southampton is doing a live event. What time but, of day are they? Pardon me? Times are going to take place? Uh, Rogers, I'm not sure where that's going to happen. I assume at the library, they must have a space there out of doors. One of the points I want to make, Dan, is that this, this book, even though it was set in 1970, it's eerily relevant because people think that Me Too started, you know, last year or whenever. But the fact is that the roots of Me Too were in 1970. There was a great deal of anger at men during that period and what was called man-hating and, uh, you know, advice to leave your marriage and leave the oppressor and, the, and hatred of the patriarchy. The difference now is that Me Too with Me Too, women have resources to hold men to account. Back in 1970, all they could do was write furious diatribes and they they wrote them by the dozen. Yeah, I think uh, in her uh, old age, uh, Betty Friedan backed away from the severity of the women's movement. And she uh, wrote about that. Actually, um, you're absolutely right, but she uh, didn't only back away from it in her old age. Betty Friedan had a vision of a peaceable kingdom. She wanted men and women to make happy lives together. She opposed all the man-hating. Uh, for, one, for one thing, she herself loved men and wanted to be loved by men. But secondly, she felt that it would alienate uh, the mainstream of women who she couldn't see depriving them of having love and marriage and a family and a life with men. Uh, whereas the radical wing of feminism was saying something entirely different. And that was the Gloria Steinem wing. And we know which one won out. Because when you think now of feminism, whom do you think of as the fig figurehead? Well, Gloria Steinem. Absolutely. And this is another drama that runs through the book because Gilda Betty Friedan saw it coming and was intensely jealous of, um, of, the, of, of the Steinem figure who never appears in the book. I wouldn't dare. She's too much of an icon. Uh, but she was basically being elevated right around the time that uh, this book takes place. And uh, it was a source of great angst and fury for Betty Friedan. 
And she saw it correctly. She saw the future. How does this book, you've written six books all together, is it correct? Yes. Uh, how is this one uh, different? In, 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 I'm sure they're all different, but how is this one uh, different from any of the others, or are they, are they all swirling around the same theme? Uh, well, to some degree, you know, they say writers always write the same book. I was interested, uh, my character, Leora, the heroine, is similar to characters in my other books because she was basically lived the ideals of feminism before they happened 10 years ahead of time. So when she tries to join the commune and Betty never wants her around because she looks too good in hot pants, uh, when, when she attempts to uh, become a, a communard, she uh, is really looking for a husband because she did feminism 10 years ago. Uh, and she landed on her, her butt and she uh, is broke and has two kids and she wants the wed what she calls the wedding plot. And she actually says the wedding plot ought to be called the health benefits plot. So I'm interested in, in women generally at that kind of strange turning point right before feminism took hold. And the, I, I see them as transitional figures, pioneers. They were embattled, yeah. but they were very heroic because they, they really conceived this whole thing and put it on the map. This book is different than my other books because it's very rooted in history. These are, are real events and they go, uh, my, uh, my, my um, agent calls it a roman à clay. And even though there are certainly identifiable people, there's no, no not recognizing Betty and one other character, but they're largely invented people because I wanted people who were somehow, who, who somehow embodied the conflicts that women felt in that period. And uh, where do you live in the Hamptons? What town are you in? Well, what? right now I'm, I'm living uh, on Hedges Lane in Sagaponic. And uh, I have to say, uh, Dan, I guess uh, the Kirkus Review mentioned it, that my portrait of the uh, upscale Hamptons is quite acerbic, to say the least. <laughs> my characters, my heroine is very much in sympathy with the underclass, all the people who, who serve them. Do you remember uh, Ethel Skull? I do. That was that was one of the famous fundraisers for the women's strike. Absolutely, and I re and I recreate that scene. Not exactly, but I was inspired by that fundraiser to create one of my party scenes. I love to write party scenes. She uh, she and her husband had a taxi cab company, as I remember. That's right. And, and uh, they were, or, and they went broke. And for some reason that I don't know, but they were selling off all their paintings and... <laughs> they had a famous art collection. Yeah. I guess pop art then. Um, yes, yeah, so there's a scene that takes place there and it's, I think it's pretty funny because everyone is trying to talk to Betty Friedan about how she liberated them and all Betty wants to do is, <laughs> is find the, the most attractive guy at the party. <laughs> Um, uh, do you spend all your time out here or are you also in the city? What else are you doing? Well, you know, dur during the, uh, the plague, I was out here almost all the time, but I'm also based in the city because I, I live on West End Avenue and I'm a film critic. That's my other hat. And uh, I need to go to screenings. There, there used to be live screenings. I don't know what's going to be happening now. Um, Plus my children live in, in Brooklyn, so I've got to be in the city. Uh, is there anything else uh, you want to tell me about about the? the I mean, oh, when is it? Is it available at this time? Can you buy it? You can you can pre-order it on Amazon, and that would be great if people did that because it. I'm told that it's helpful. And I will hold the book up because that's what people should. Yeah, do. actually, that is an actual photograph of the march, the women's strike. Yes. Which, uh, I was not there, but I uh, did a lot of research. I studied every one of those pictures and I, I did my best to re recreate it. It was an amazing, amazing moment really in our culture. I think that anyone who wants to know, you know, what went on behind the scenes with these people who created a social revolution can relate to this book. Well, thank you very much for stopping by and I enjoyed the conversation. This is Erica Abiel on uh, Dan's podcast, and uh, we'll I'll be seeing you and uh, 
uh, around, and I'll be happy to read, read through the, right to the end of the book. I've started reading it, and it is very well written. Uh, thank you so much. I hope you get a few laughs out of it. <laughs> nice to see you again, Dan. Oh, you too. I see you on the jitney sometimes. That's right. That's the last time I saw you. Um, yeah, I think you you wrote stuff way back when you were writing books uh, in the seventies, I think, weren't you? Yes. They were yes. More erotic, some of them, I think. Uh, yeah. Yes, they were. I'm trying to think of the commune is. It has its moments. It's been called a romantic satire, and there are lots of affairs and romances in it. Well, again, thanks for coming by. And thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.